This is a quick introduction to perfusion imaging as it applies to the brain. We're not going to talk about the pathology that we assess with perfusion imaging. We're just going to talk about how we acquire these images and what the physics is behind it. There's a lot of different ways to measure brain perfusion. We can use CT perfusion, where we measure a bolus of iodinated contrast as it goes through the brain. We can use dynamic contrast enhancement on MRI, which is very similar to this concept on CT. We can use dynamic susceptibility contrast on MRI, where we're looking at blood flow and how it changes over time. And if we want to get quantitative, we can use xenon perfusion imaging. Now, it's important to understand that the first three of the acquisition types listed here are not quantitative. The only one on this list that is quantitative is xenon perfusion. It can give us an actual number of milliliters per gram of brain tissue per minute. Unfortunately, xenon perfusion has gone out of style and most institutions no longer offer it. For the rest of the lecture, I'm mostly going to be talking as though we're talking about CT perfusion of the brain, but the same principles apply in MRI as well. The basic concept is that we're trying to analyze this curve. This curve is a plot of signal, whether that is CT density, whether that is MRI intensity, whether it's the inverse of MRI intensity in the case of susceptibility imaging, and it's signal of some sort over time. What we see if we measure a bolus of contrast entering the brain parenchyma is that at first the contrast rushes in and then it sort of peaks and then it flows back out again. This is the systolic portion of the curve and this is the diastolic portion of the curve. How do we create a curve like that? Well, we repeatedly measure the same slice on the CT over and over again, and we watch the contrast flow in. Then we fit a line to those points that we've just created. And the line never fits the points perfectly, but we like a nice smooth curve. That's how we generate this curve that we're now going to analyze. Now, we generate this curve at every single pixel on the CT scan. So if we showed you that curve at every single pixel, it would look something like this. Every pixel in the image would have its own curve. It would be impossible for our eyes to analyze that much data. So we've got to find a way to summarize the curves at every single pixel to turn these complex curves into a few simple parameters. So let's talk about those parameters. The first thing we're going to do is measure where the curve meets its peak. And there it is, the top of the curve. And we're going to measure the amount of time it takes from point zero when we inject the contrast to that time to peak. That time is called the time to peak. And that's one of the parameters we're going to use. Now, there's a lot of other ways to measure the time. You can measure the average time it takes to go through. It doesn't have to be time to peak, but in some way you're going to measure the amount of time it takes for the contrast material to get to the brain parenchyma. Time to peak is the easiest to demonstrate. The next parameter that we're going to analyze is cerebral blood flow. We're going to take the upslope of this curve and extend it as a straight line, the maximum, the maximum angle that we can find on the curve. And we're going to measure the angle of the line that we come up with, and the angle of that line is what we're calling cerebral blood flow. The third parameter we're going to utilize is the area under this curve. So if we measure the area all under the curve and sum that up, the area under the curve is going to represent cerebral blood volume. So those are the three basic parameters. We use some variations on them, but those are the three basic parameters that we use to analyze these complex perfusion curves. So how can this change in different parts of the brain? Well, if there is an obstruction to blood flow, then we get a different type of pulsation 
called a TARDIS at Parvis waveform. Instead of this nice peak and washout, we instead get a slow and small curve. That's what TARDIS at Parvis means, a slow and small curve where it doesn't go quite as high in peak and it takes longer to reach its peak. What effect does this have on our parameters when we have obstruction to flow? So let's take the first parameter, time to peak. There's time to peak on the normal curve. What happens to time to peak on the TARDIS at Parvis curve? Well, here it takes a lot longer to peak, so the amount of time to peak is greater. Increased time to peak is what we expect for obstruction of flow. Let's take the next example, cerebral blood flow. There's our maximum angle on the normal curve, and here's the maximum angle of the TARDIS at Parvis waveform. You can see the angle is less, so we have decreased blood flow when we have obstruction. Our third parameter, cerebral blood volume, well, this one's not so clear. We certainly have more volume in the systolic phase on the normal curve, but then the TARDIS at Parvis curve has time during diastole to make up for it. So it's not clear how this balances out and whether there's really going to be a reduction in blood volume. That's why blood volume is our most specific parameter. That is, it takes the longest, it takes the most severe obstruction in order to produce a difference in blood volume. Carrying that theme a little further, the most sensitive of our parameters is time to peak. That's the one that's going to go bad first. That's one, the one that will first show abnormal perfusion. The most specific parameter is blood volume. It's the last to go. So you expect first time to peak to become abnormal, then cerebral blood flow to become abnormal, then cerebral blood volume to become abnormal as you get more and more occluded proximal to the area you're measuring. In summary, in perfusion imaging, we use reproducible parameters from this complex perfusion curve that would be very difficult for us to interpret at each pixel in the image. These parameters vary in sensitivity so that we can approximate the severity of hypoperfusion. Remember that these are all relative values. None of these are actual measurements of of perfusion. So you need to compare to an area of normal tissue to know how severe the abnormality is or whether there's really an abnormality there.